Citizens have lived for generations within a system which says to them that the state has the power to determine their behavior and not the other way around. And so the question we have to bring into the Soviet Union at this time when there's more radical change going on than any I have seen in my lifetime is where are they going to learn the attitudes that will make their democracy function? It seems that every placard carries the word democracy. As I push through the crowd, Vera Reich, my guide and more than interpreter, is constantly translating the surrounding talk, and it seems to be mostly about leaders. This man, a supporter of the radical deputy Boris Yeltsin, is denouncing the corruption and privileges of the conservative Politburo member Ligachov. This confirms the impression I have that these people are all looking for a powerful leader. Yeah. And their version of democracy is to get a leader they want. Of course. Not the idea of doing the political work themselves as citizens, but of finding some big tough man to tell them what to do. Absolutely. Well, you know, this nation and these people, well, you know, are dying to have a strong hand so that they will, you know, they've always believed in, good, in a good czar. The government has no other people, but the people may get a different government. The kind of government they're demonstrating for is democratic. But what does that word mean in this context? Everyone has his own Russia. Our Russia is democratic. Our Russia is multilingual and free. The Russian intelligentsia, workers, and peasants will find enough strength to be burned at the stake for this new democratic Russia. Do you see a time coming when the people will begin to take over and tell the leaders what to do? Yes, I see a time. Instead of waiting for the leaders to tell yes. you what to do? How long? I think about five, ten years. That soon? That soon. That's very quick. Our people are very strong. About 45 minutes after the main crowd had moved off down the avenue to join up with the second group, we found this little rump forming up here and for the first time in today's demonstrations found a Soviet flag. Also one of the mottoes says, hands off the image of Lenin. We want to see Lenin, well, you know, the way we have been, well, you know, we've always looked. So these are supporters of the old classical tradition of the Communist Party of the USSR. Yeah. Comrades, 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 they want to carve up our country. This is the age-old dream of the imperialists and Zionists and people like them. They dream of destroying Russia. The glasnost does not free up only the voices of democracy. It also frees up that darker voice of anger, xenophobia, anti-Semitism. Our industrial forces and our cooperation are being destroyed across the country. This kind of argument used to take place behind closed doors, if at all, and never in front of strangers. And I think I'm going to be able to tell my grandchildren that I was there. It might not be the storming of the Tsar's palace, no bodies or gunfire today, but it's a warning that the people can organize themselves and speak for themselves without official sanction or intrusion. 
The next morning, I drop in on the offices of Moscow News, said to be one of the most radical newspapers in the Soviet Union. The paper comes out two days from now, and so the editors have to decide at this meeting just how much space they'll give to yesterday's democracy demonstration. Vitaly Trechikov has been an editor for the last two years at Moscow News. Is Moscow News playing some kind of a leading-edge role in all this? Here is a good example of what Moscow News means to the Soviet Union. Today's edition of Pravda, a day after the demonstration. You saw how many people were there, and what does Pravda write about one of the most important events of Perestroika. This tiny column is about demonstrations all across the country, and here is a little bit about the demonstration in Moscow. We can't do that. We will do a large article with many photographs because it was a real event. In your mind, what is the biggest single obstacle to the realization of democracy in the Soviet Union? The main obstacle is the existing system of one-party monopoly which penetrates all areas of our society. This is the principal objective obstacle. The main subjective problem is that the system has corrupted the souls of the people. People don't know how to work properly. They don't want to work. And the consequences of this has been the complete destruction of our consumer market and of our monetary system which wasn't functioning normally anyway. Muscovites like to think of themselves as being cosmopolitan, more European than other Soviet citizens. They are acutely aware that there is more out there. Better clothes, better goods, better service, better food. And somehow, they don't seem to be getting any of it, or at least not getting it from state-run enterprises. This is not state-run. This is Moscow's Rishki Market, a market run by private entrepreneurs. I'd like to find out how much it would cost to buy a set of ribs like that. Can we ask? Простите, пожалуйста. Простите. Пожалуйста. They wouldn't talk. They won't talk. They won't. What they're doing is legal, but what they don't want is publicity. Selling at this private market, they don't have to explain how they get their goods, nor why they charge so much for them. Thank you very much. How much for a kilo? Ten. Ten? Ten. Is that special price for me? It is special for me. No, no, it's everybody. These prices don't seem as exaggerated as I Of course I not, which is why I could have seen perhaps let's try and take advantage. <laughs> because this is for the camera. It's for the camera. Yeah. And if there was no camera? Well, then I think tomatoes would cost 15 rubles. We've just bought 15? them. 15? Yeah. And, well, you know, apples about the same sort of price. Tangerines, 15 rubles. But suppose we went to a government store and went after the same kind of produce. What would it well, be there? it's much more expensive. This is more expensive? Of course. Could you find tomatoes of that quality in a government store? Well, of course not. Especially not in the winter time. The prices are high, and only a few people and a few places can afford them. One place that can afford these prices is this cooperative restaurant in the heart of Moscow. This exclusive private cafe is reported to bring in three million American dollars a year. So this is primarily for foreigners, dollars, marks, pounds, or credit. Well, they don't accept cash here. They're not allowed. They only accept credit cards anyway. What do you mean they're not allowed? I thought this was private enterprise. I mean, they are regulated. Well, of course, this state president is Do you think we could get the uh, the owner to come in and chat with us? Okay, why? Well, Will you ask him? Well, I'll try. Okay, I'll try. So, what did he say? Thousand dollars. 
What do you mean a thousand dollars? Well, he wants a thousand dollars for his interview. He says he's very expensive. The oft-warned-of assault from the West turns out to be nothing but a big Mac attack. At ten in the morning, the lineups are long at what some arch-conservatives see as a symbol of Western decadence. No thoughts of Ronald McDonald here, and here the lineup is even longer. This remains the holiest shrine in this now not-so-atheistic land, the Tomb of Lenin. Here lies a man some continue to see as symbolizing all that was good from the revolution. Lenin, they say, represents a time when you could be proud to be a communist. Some Soviets say that another leader deserves recognition for trying to change things. Here lies the desk-thumping, hard-drinking, intemperate, maverick leader, Khrushchev. But Nikita Sergeyevich, you never quite got it right, did you? You made too many enemies in the Politburo. And in the end, they threw him out. They ousted him. He lies buried here in a celebrity cemetery. You can find poets and artists and musicians and inventors, military heroes, even a cosmonaut, but not another leader. All the rest of them are buried up there at the Kremlin. But just behind the wall in the Kremlin... Lenin's vision of a communist state is undergoing radical change. Driving up to watch a session of the Soviet equivalent of our parliament, I fully expect the extremely tight security, the meticulous, unsmiling KGB checks of documents and passports and equipment. What I am not prepared for is this, a media scrum. In the Soviet Union, you have to take into account that this is a union of autonomous states, and the president should play the role of a coordinator, of an arbiter in disputes between republics, or between the republics and the central power. The Supreme Soviet is the top lawmaking body. A small group of radical deputies is getting the lion's share of media attention, as they press more and more for elements of practical democracy. It's essential that the president be elected by the people. <laughs> this session is about power, about whether during the precarious transition to greater democracy, the leader should be given extra powers to help stabilize the process. Boris Yeltsin is demanding more power to the people, not to the president. I ask him if, psychologically, the Soviet people still need a strong leader. We do need a strong leader, but not for, you know, as we used to understand. Democratically strong, with a strong legislature, which can control the power of the president. Does that mean that the leader must be responsive to the wishes of the people? Of course, we will support him if not the people. He will never be cleverer than the people, even the most brilliant leader like the one we have here. Gorbachev has his own supporters working these corridors of power. But now we need a strong executive power, and I think the details have to be discussed, and they are being discussed. Is there a mood in the Soviet to grant Mr. Gorbachev extraordinary powers? You know, people don't like this word. I know they don't. Yes, uh, I would say to grant him extraordinary responsibility would be them. The Supreme Soviet is now televised. They tried it live, but all over the USSR, people downed tools to watch, spellbound, the up-to-now unheard-of voices of opposition. So now they tape it for evening release. The journalists, once handed formal, typed official versions, now have to watch, analyze, interpret, and write diligently, because they know the people will be watching, and they'd better get it right. I bump into a fellow Canadian, Ron Bastokas, 
back from using his video camera to try getting it right in Lithuania, where he was born. But the most striking uh, image of all was, was the burning of a, of a, of a card, at the, uh, the burning of the um, uh, draft card at the celebrations of independence on the uh, 16th of February. Uh, it's symbolic of, of the degree of determination that exists among the Lithuanian people to become independent again. They're saying now that uh, whatever happens, they'll persevere to the very end. Once, once you've tasted freedom, it, it's, it's very difficult to uh, let go of it. Uh, so I, I think that uh, what will happen in Lithuania is probably what has happened elsewhere in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, people, the people are simply through the sheer force of determination, they're going to see this through. And just outside, proof of what that thirst for freedom can accomplish newly chosen Czechoslovakian President Václav Havel has seen his own world turned upside down. Last week, the White House. This week, the Kremlin. Yesterday, conversations only with his communist jailers. Today, private discussions with the supreme communist leader. Do you and President Gorbachev have the same definition of democracy? <laughs> we had to discuss such many things that we hadn't time to make a definition of democracy. Do you believe you share a view of democracy, a common view of democracy? I think that our, our viewpoint, viewpoint is uh, similar. Similar. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Для того чтобы продолжать процесс. The debate in here today has been about the presidency. There's a terrific fascination in this country with power. And that's always translated into power from the top. Even in here, in what is really the supreme parliament of the Soviet Union, those few members who actually have any power have it because Mr. Gorbachev permits them to have it. And he's even asking them to give him more power. Coming down from that gallery after the Supreme Soviet adjourns, I stumble across a meeting. Boris Yeltsin has assembled the interregional group, dissident deputies from different parts of the USSR, who are not under the Gorbachev spell, and who are having their own problems hammering out a common position on the issue of special executive powers. It will be known by our people, our voters, and they will understand our position, and that is important. They used to reply to divisions and power struggles with the prisons, exile, bribery, and bullets that went with their power. The main image of power is executive power, strong power, immediate in action. The strong man. Yes. The deputy named Sergei Stankevich identifies a crucial issue of the culture of democracy. One of the biggest obstacles is a lack of political culture, a lack of tolerance, mutual tolerance, um, a lack of uh, um, art, lack of art of reasonable compromise. It is uh, one of the most important things for any political, democratic political life, art of reasonable compromise, the lack of such things, unfortunately. Uh, we have a long tradition of uh, violent conflicts. In order to learn the lessons of democracy, you should start uh, to practice democracy. It's the only way for us. But years of totalitarianism leave scars of anger, suspicion, hatred, obstacles to democracy, as I find out in the next country I visit. It was 
meant to be another orchestrated round of ritual applause, but amazingly they began to boo, and when they saw Ceausescu falter, it turned into a revolution. in Bucharest to find Romania still grieving two months after its bloody revolution. Bucharest in the morning. It was once called the Paris of the Balkans. But then Lenin's shadow fell across its sunlit streets. And it takes more than a few months to turn the sunlight on again after a lifetime of Stalin and Ceausescu and the entrenched apparatus of terror and suspicion. We thought, we felt, that this system will be forever. One of the most important things we could manage uh, to prepare the revolution, this revolution, the conscience of the people, were uh, our theaters, our uh, poems, and in general our, our art. Jan Karamitru is a man of the theater, one of Romania's best-known actors. He's still playing Hamlet every Saturday night. He's also taken on another role, independent candidate and vice president in charge of culture. Could you imagine that the, the last three or four winters we had no heating system in the theaters? We worked uh, on a temperature under zero, and we had full house people dressed like in skiing clothes and so on, uh, staying there trembling for five hours of this performance, the five hours, entire text, we didn't cut any word. And uh, looking at and hearing a play like Hamlet in which uh, a man, an intellectual, is under the pressure of a dictatorship in, in fight to uh, to get the truth, in, in fight to... Uh, discover himself and his responsibility in the in a world which is a bloody one. It's it was their case. I saw very young people, students and crying to the older generation to come to join them. And I went with them and, and some of these people told me, You you are an actor, must go home, you are in danger. Don't stay here. They say, no, it's, our life has no other sense from this moment except to fight for liberty. If we are all together, we win. We told to the soldiers, to the officers, and the tanks, and so on, what happened, and they joined us, they embraced people, they started to cry, and we went to the television building. Get out on the street, Romanian. Come here to the Romanian television. Now I have here Mircea Dinescu, of whom you all heard of. In a modern revolution, if you want to know who's winning, look who's in control of the TV station. We ask for the trust and understanding of all Romanians and minorities to help us build a better future. I don't have any authorization because there is nobody in command anymore. But I tell you from the bottom of my heart, nobody will shoot against the people. And the army in Bucharest did not shoot at the people. But the Securitate, the terrorist secret police, seized buildings around the TV station and poured their fire on it. We were under fire, particularly from that tall building in front of this office. Evidently, terrorists were not only in these buildings, but in the ones nearer to us also. As a matter of fact, one can see the bullet holes from when they were shot at, from this street, from the side street, and also from the street on our right, where the house of Valentin Ceausescu, the eldest son of the dictator, was to be found.
They've decided to leave some of the bullet holes in place, just as they'd left Mr. Constantine running the television service. I'm amazed that you were able to keep your job as director general because the, the revolutionaries must have thought of you as an agent of Ceausescu. Anyway, I feel better beyond compare now because we are really free to control our activity, to put it in the service of the country because this institution really belongs to the people. And that's all the answer I'm going to get on that subject. All over the country they seem to be challenging each other. What did you do under Ceausescu? Here at the Peasant Party headquarters, many could proudly say, we were in prison. I've noticed lots of gray hair around here, but not very many young people. What is there in the politics of your party that will attract Romania's young generation? I would like to tell you that Generally speaking, all of the new parties in Romania have similar programs. All proclaim liberty, democracy. But the position of a person who starts to proclaim this idea only now, when freedom has arrived, is questionable. Isn't it more worthy to proclaim your principles from prison, for example? These young Romanians can just as proudly claim that they were out on the streets during those heady days of revolution. Now, yeah. the biggest obstacle is... Obstacles to democracy. Yes, that uh, the only men who knows how, po how to make politics are the communists. They are the only men who in 45 years make politics and are in the politics life. And they know that the, the, the very big problem now is that the communists could came to the power and there are so many yeah, now in the, the, the power. You don't the have to be manipulated anymore by, by one person or by one party, even if it's called the front. I think it was a big thing what happened in the East Europe, the Bulgarian, so near from us, and we heard about this, yeah. how Jeep goes down East Germany and something like this, and we say, look, it can be do something. Yeah, we are next. <laughs> yes. We, we didn't know we exactly how it will be, make, but, but we didn't know how to make it. We can't have uh, democracy without uh, having a very, very good uh, foundation, economic foundation. Of course, it's much easier to destroy than to construct something. We destroyed it in a few days. It was very much more difficult than we thought, but anyway, it, it's easier to destroy. And now we have to, to build something, to reconstruct. There were so many material problems, and the people had no time to think about politics and fighting like this. And this was the politics of Ceausescu. Yeah. You come from the from your work and you must go to buy something and you think it is going in your home and something like this and you have no time to think about the politics in Romania. Have no time. You were so tired you couldn't. Why were they all so tired? Walking down the boulevard of the victory of socialism, I could see why. Why the signs calling for the downfall of Ceausescu. Ceausescu had been bleeding the treasury dry to pay for glory. Monumental glory. A city center of absurd, palatial, outsized government buildings, conceived in what Ceausescu thought of as heroic style. And at their summit, the most spectacular architectural abomination I have ever seen. They don't know what to do with it now. The stonemasons and workers and engineers and architects who put it together are proud of it. It's a Romanian achievement. And yet it's also the self-willed monument to a monstrous, egomaniacal tyrant. And so now they don't know what to do with it. Nearly a square mile of beautiful old South Bucharest was torn down to make room for it, winding streets and old, small, traditional houses. Up to 20,000 workmen at one time labored inside there, and probably no accounting will ever produce an accurate balance sheet of the millions that it cost, while the rest of the country went without. The lineups are not so long as they were. It's not quite so tiring as it was. And every so often you come across a piece of meat and some entrepreneurial enterprise, and the slow process of rebuilding a normal society has begun. 
Do you believe the change is going to last? Stop! Stop. 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 De moment, no începe de cuza, la noi e țara cea mai bogată. Nu mai apare comunismul, nu există. We don't believe that no, it will come again. Niciodată nu o să apare. Never în primul rând, tineret. Because the young people uh, da. don't want The young people? The young people da. don't want it anymore. I have been told that on the 21st and 22nd of December, it was the young people who led the action, and they had to persuade old guys like me and him to come across. Uh, Is that true? The young, young people uh, should be given a flower. Pentru ceea ce a făcut tineretul, toată dragostea și recunoștința noastră. Ei ne-au adus libertate. For what they did, we, uh, we have to thank them. Most of the faces in this town still look pretty serious their eyes pretty narrow and watchful. Romania is a nation that has yet to destroy its cancer of hatred, paranoia, suspicion. This is the headquarters of the executive committee that's trying to run this country now, and at least one of the new revolutionary leaders is reminding us that his revolution took place almost 200 years exactly after the French Revolution and has certain characteristics in common with that earlier upheaval which led me to reflect that within a very few years the leaders of that French Revolution were almost all dead, their heads cut off, and the young democracy itself had degenerated into a dictatorship. On the way out of town, we come upon a crowd and stop to find out what's up. determined to get him down. And it seems to me, he's just as determined to stay. Halfway across Hungary now, streaking towards the Czech border, watching outside the greening of this incredible East European Spring of 1990. I can't help wondering if they got him knocked down last night in Bucharest, old Vladimir Illich. Wasn't that an astounding crowd last night? That wasn't an angry mob calling down with the tyrant. That was a group of tolerant, amused people saying, well, if we don't get him down tonight, we'll get him down tomorrow night or next weekend or whenever. Tapping out thoughts in my journal, I'm tempted to get off the train for a while in northern Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia. But I've only four days left. And what's drawing me on is the country where this new spirit of liberty in Eastern Europe seems to a lot of people to have first burst into flame. And the first stop is the Church of St. Stanislav Kosta in Warsaw, where they bury Jerzy Popiewuszko, the young priest who was tortured and beaten to death and tossed in the river in 1984. The thousands who came to his funeral all knew that the government had done it because Popiewuszko supported the Solidarity Movement. But this was not a cry for revenge. The Cardinal, who celebrated the Requiem Mass here that day, called instead for dialogue. It was and it is non-violent movement and the you know, ideology of solidarity you know, and the position of like, violence in Poland. And of course, Polish Catholic Church. Scientist, head of the underground publishing company Nova, and for one year, political prisoner, Gregor Boguta. Was that nonviolence a deliberate choice, or was it a deliberate choice 
in the fact that there was no way you could conduct armed resistance against the state? I think it, it, it was a real choice of people because we we uh, we could have an access to to any weapon in Poland uh, because we we developed uh, contacts with the, some members of Polish army. Uh, we didn't build uh, bombs, uh, uh, weapon uh, <laughs> against uh, communists. Our weapon, there were books, uh, <laughs> bulletins, and <laughs> newspapers. I think that most of political prisoners in Poland, I estimated it's, uh, over 80%, there were people uh, engaged in publishing, uh, underground publishing industry in Poland, because it was in my opinion, the most important activity uh, against the uh, communist regime in Poland. Baguda's underground publishing house, Nova, used to sell illegally, clandestinely. Now, the new government allows it out in the sunshine and calls it officially underground. Is it still technically illegal to sell these books here? Uh, right now, no. But it will be illegal from an economic point of view. These underground publishers will have to somehow legalize their existence. So, you can say it will be a kind of economic underground. Ironically, the most hated man in Poland now may be the finance minister who's trying to capitalize the country's economic system, Leszek Balcerowicz. Uh, if we compare the countries uh, which once were at a similar level of economic development, but then the economic system diverged, like, let's say, East and West Germany, or North and South Korea, or to some extent Hungary and Austria. So the results uh, are clear due to the difference in the economic system. The, so socialist, the socialist economic system performed very badly as compared to the results achieved under the, if you will, capitalistic economic system or free market economy. They call it the Polish disease. Even in Moscow, they say that if perestroika goes too far, it'll look like the disastrous Polish economy. So what's what's new that's going on here that wasn't going on a year ago or six months ago? Well, the, the food market and the, the vegetable market was always there. What's new is people selling sugar and butter and what well, is this meat from the lorries. Ah, that's good. That's cool. Can you make more money here than you would if you were selling through a shop? <laughs> if I were to sell it in a store, it would have to cost 30% more. Were you able to sell in the street here before the elections or before the round table talks? Nobody would sell this cheese to me. Aha. So you're in an entirely new business as a result of the political situation. Okay, you're an entrepreneur. You could say that the new business really began when the old communist government in Poland finally conceded that there was an opposition in the country after all. And they sat down at a round table to negotiate a new deal. And with that very act, the old regime began to fade and disappear. We didn't lack for differences of opinion, heated polemics, and even sharp exchanges. That was something to be expected. But to come to this round table, we've had to go a long distance along a very difficult route. The old professional, though they may not realize it yet, are handing power over to a bunch of amateurs which is where political democracy really begins to get to work. It's amazing. In the parliament, former prisoners and their jailers working side by side. The whole thing covered by TV, which always used to be nothing but a government mouthpiece. TV is lying. It was the common slogan of the society since uh, perhaps 20 years, and especially after the martial law was involved. You know. TV is lying. Everybody, every Polish child knew it. So coming here, coming to this to this post, 
Uh, well, I first of all, I would like to, to, to really to, to create a kind of the new credibility. The head of TV now is a scholar and author, Andrzej Dravic. He too spent years in prison. My first step was to ask the people who were thrown out because of the political grounds uh, after the martial law was involved. So I, I have signed a letter to all of them inviting them to come back. To come back. Uh, the second step was to immediately to, to put a sight of the camera, of the picture, of the, of, the, of the window, as we call the TV, the people who were most hated by the society, you know, like, uh, like the presenters of, 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 of the, that's to say, a, a small group of them. But uh, still, no atmosphere of the hunting for the witches. Perhaps it is the only way, I think. Otherwise, uh, well, it will be ra rather something like, like Romanian way, let us yeah. say. So, you know, and everything is changing immediately, you know, one is accusing another, and, and I can hardly see what is the possibility of normal work. Warsaw is not all of Poland, and I keep wondering if the tolerance I am hearing in the capital cities that I visit on this whirlwind trip would be so generously expressed in the villages. But I've only one day left and one final trip to make. I'm driving almost 300 kilometers north of Warsaw. My destination is the port city of Gdansk with its famous shipyards. In Gdansk and its sister city, Gdynia, there has been a political movement that captured the world's attention for almost as long as we've been watching the developments in Eastern Europe. For ten years, I've been hearing of a man from Gdansk whose movement has done as much to raise the Iron Curtain as Gorbachev with his perestroika and glasnost. I feel I can't leave Poland without checking it out. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of absurdities, a lot that is wrong. That's why it would be a mistake to start fighting among ourselves, settling accounts. Nearly every Thursday, Lech Wałęsa goes before the people too, but face to face, in a kind of huge seminar or workshop on democracy, where even foreign media can take part. Patrick Watson, uh, Televisia Kanadiska. You've said that you will uh, stay around in case your old friends get into trouble, stay around to help. But what if your old friends in government say, okay, like, we can handle it now, we don't need you anymore, you can go fishing. While the people say, no, like, stay, we need you. What will you do then? <laughs> If I were a member of the government, I'd listen to the government. But as you know, I wasn't tempted to join the government. I haven't accepted the premier's seat. I've stayed with you. Not because I wouldn't be able to manage, but I didn't want to abandon you. Up until now, my role was exclusively to oversee and lead the fight for your right to make good in all fields. In terms of positions and policies for the struggle to be fair, so that you could work out your programs, whether that be social, political, economical, and other programs. That was my role. You want to be ministers, you want to be deputies, you want everything, including premierships and presidencies. It is all in your hands. But you have to want it. Today, we already have these opportunities. But that's not the danger. The danger is if you don't go for it. Someone's got to do it. If we stand aside, someone else will grab it. If you want to live better, and you obviously do, and if you really want to manage this country in a proper fashion and make this country great, then you better get to work. Otherwise, if Bowenza does it for you, then you'll regret it. So I've come to the last shoot of the last day of this dizzying trip through the changing political landscape of Eastern Europe. find myself here in a Union Hall on the Baltic Sea Coast, just across the road from some of those shipyards where it all began here in Poland. And thinking back 2,500 years to certain other men of the ships, sailors in ancient Athens who stormed back into the city, 
to wrest the democracy back out of the hands of the tyrants who had taken it away. And those sailors of ancient Athens and their fellow Democrats showed an amazing amount of tolerance towards the tyrants who had killed and imprisoned and exiled them and taken away their property. And these shipyard workers and their fellow Democrats are showing an amazing amount of tolerance to their former oppressors who killed and tortured and jailed and exiled, confiscated property. And what Lech Walesa was saying to them in this hall today was that now it's up to them. You've got to take the power back into your own hands, he said. But when you do, if the rule of law is going to work, if the sharing of power is going to work, if pluralism is going to work, if, in short, democracy is going to work, you're going to have to use that power with tolerance.